Thank you very much for including my paper in the program. It's a great, great pleasure to be here. So my paper is on carbon pricing and monetary policy. And so to give you a bit of motivation, we know that the EU now aims to become a low carbon economy with sustainable energy production. And the main instrument we have right now for this is the EU emission trading system, which works as a carbon market where firms can buy, sell and even trade emission allowances so they can emit carbon into the atmosphere. And this then essentially gives a, carbon, a market price to carbon, which is also pretty volatile when you look at it in the data. And so we have empirical evidence, and I will also talk about this in more detail in a second, that this turns out to be an effective measure for reducing carbon emissions, but it also has macroeconomic implications in the sense that it increases inflation, so it creates from energy prices inflationary pressures, which has also been a concern for central banks with the term greenflation, and it also has effects on output by like, decreasing output through higher energy prices. And so the two questions I ask in my paper is first, can macroclimate models that we have account exactly for the empirical effects of carbon price shocks that we see in the data? And second, how should monetary policy respond to carbon price shocks? So in more detail, what I do in this paper is to first provide empirical evidence using the carbon price shock series from Kensic 2023 on effects of carbon price shocks in the euro area. And then I use this empirical effects to estimate a macroclimate model with energy to match these empirical impulse responses. And to give you a bit of foreshadowing, kind of the key model features that turn out to be important are first limited substitutability between green and fossil energy, so that it's tough to substitute between those two in the short term. And in addition to that, also to have some kind of friction in fossil energy adjustment. And third, it's also important to have heterogeneous households in some sense to capture the macroeconomic effects of these shocks. And then lastly, as I said, I assess the optimal monetary policy response to carbon price shocks. So let me skip the literature in the interest of time and head directly to the empirical analysis. So I use quarterly euro area data from 1999 to 2019. And I used local projections, again, with the carbon price shock series from Kensic 2023 to assess the effects of carbon price shocks on different euro area variables like prices, and also macroeconomic variables, but also emissions and energy. Yes, and so, again, I use local projections. I use dependent variables, uh, lags of dependent variables as controls, and I include a linear time trend. So let's have a look at the results. So you see here the results to a positive shock in carbon prices. And the shock is normalized to increase annualized energy inflation by one percentage point. So this is what you see in the upper left. And you see that from this increase in energy prices, we also see an immediate increase, of course, in headline inflation, because energy is part of the consumption basket. But we also see a slight, like a smaller, but still a slight increase in inflation excluding energy, because of course, energy prices also increase the marginal cost of firms and therefore also propagate to um, HICP inflation excluding energy. And here at the bottom, so of course, we have an increase in the fossil energy price, but what we see here also is what I mentioned in the beginning, is that these types of shocks, even if here it's temporary, seems to be effective in decreasing emissions. So we see a decline in greenhouse gas emissions, which um, probably comes from the decline in industrial energy production that you also see here, because the response, as you can see, is fairly similar. What is interesting here to see is that in contrast to prices, this doesn't happen immediately, right? So we see a rather gradual decline in the response of emissions, which peaks only like five or six quarters after the shock. Okay, now let's have a look at more like um, variables on the real side of the economy. So we see here clearly also a significant contraction in real activity. So real GDP, especially a significant response in real consumption, but also in investment wages and capacity utilization. So we see an effect on the macroeconomy. As for the monetary policy response, it's from this data, not like it's not easy to measure a significant response here. So as you can see, the response is mostly insignificant. There might be some evidence of leaning against the shock in the beginning, but for the most part, it's rather insignificant. 
Okay, so I would now like to give you an overview of the model, but I, in the interest of time, I will focus on the parts that are important for the estimation and that are also a bit non-standard. So as I said, it's important to have some kind of heterogeneity in the household sector. And so I use a very simple tank framework so that part of the population are like standard Ricardian permanent income households and the other part are hand to mouth. So they consume all of their disposable income in one period. They have standard preferences. And the special thing is here that households consume a bundle of non-energy goods and energy directly and that also these two types of households have heterogeneous energy shares. So that hand-to-mouth households consume a relatively larger share of energy in their consumption bundle, which makes them, of course, more vulnerable to these types of shocks. Then on the firm side, we have something similar. So we have the production function now being a CES bundle of like the classic Cobb Douglas uh, capital labor bundle and energy that is also used in production. And yes, the, firm, uh, the model has sticky prices and sticky wages. And there is a climate change externality that negatively affects TFP, but this is mostly important for like more larger transition scenarios for small transitory shocks. and doesn't have too big of an effect. Okay, and the heart, at the heart of the model are the energy sector firms. So energy that is used in consumption production is again a CES bundle of green energy that is environmentally friendly and fossil energy which produces carbon emissions. And here are the, the frictions I talked about in the fossil energy that I include for now like a simple quadratic adjustment cost in fossil energy use, which just prevents the energy firms from cutting down immediately on their fossil energy use in response to a shock. And the, the carbon policy that this uh, paper is about enters here in the energy firms. Again, that the government puts a tax, which is pretty equivalent to an ETS system, puts a tax on their fossil energy use, so it makes fossil energy use more expensive. Okay, and so as for the policy side, here again, as I said, the government levies a carbon tax on fossil energy firms, and this carbon tax is modeled as an AR1 process here, since I'm interested in the effects of carbon price shocks. And the Taylor rule, the central bank rule, is in the baseline version, it focuses on stabilizing headline inflation and GDP. Okay, so now what I do with this model is to first calibrate a set of parameters for the euro area and then estimate based on that the remaining parameters. And I estimated using Bayesian impulse response matching developed in Cristiano Trabant and Valentin. And what this essentially does is to minimize the distance between the impulse responses produced by the model and the analog objects um, from the data that I showed you in the beginning from the local projections. So these are the calibrated parameters, not to go into much detail. As I said, they are either calibrated to match the euro area energy sector or like are just fairly standard variables, uh, fairly standard values. And also for the estimated parameters, I don't want to go through this big table in detail, but I want to talk about some of these estimated parameters that are really key for shaping the responses of the model here in more detail. And the first one is, as I mentioned in the beginning, that the substitution elasticity between green and fossil energy turns out to be very low from the estimation. So that it's significantly below unity, which is a bit non-standard. Of course, this is kind of a product of this estimation being rather short term. So I don't have like decades of data that really shapes how these two are then substituted over a long period of time, but like in response to these transitory carbon price shocks, the estimation gives me that these are very hard to substitute in the short term. And in addition to that, I also get a significantly positive value for the fossil energy adjustment costs. So the value of 10 is pretty hard to interpret in itself, but the important thing is that the value is positive. And so there needs to be like some adjustment to account for like these gradual, um, gradual dynamics that we have seen in the local projections. Then, as I mentioned, so the estimation gives me a positive share of hand-to-mouth households, which is also in line with other estimates for the euro area. So household heterogeneity seems to shape the response of the macroeconomy as well. 
And in addition to the first point also, not only green and fossil energy seem to be complementary, but even more energy and non-energy goods in consumption and production seems to be very strong complements, which makes sense, I think, that you cannot really substitute energy against something else in your consumption bundle easily. Okay, so having a quick look at the results, so here, um, in the black line and the gray areas, you see the responses from the data, and the blue line is the response of my model. And we see here that the model does a pretty good job now with these features that we discussed to match the responses from the data. So mainly it matches like the three main features being the immediate surge in inflation, the gradual decline in greenhouse gas emissions, and also the pretty, pretty significant decline in real activity, especially consumption. Okay, so for the last four minutes, let me talk a little bit about monetary policy in this model. So as you have seen from the responses, this carbon price shock, since it's also um, effectively an energy price shock, creates a trade-off for monetary policy in the sense that it increases inflation, but it decreases output. So re the response to this is non-trivial. And now what I do is to compare alternative monetary policy scenarios to the baseline Taylor rule that I showed you before. And the first one is a very easy exercise. It's just in the Taylor rule that I showed you, swapping out headline inflation for a core inflation. And the second one is a Ramsey planner maximizing social welfare, so population-weighted social welfare of both agents that I have in my model. Yes, and showing us the optimal response of monetary policy. And here we have the results from that. So what you see here from in the blue line is exactly the responses that you have seen just two slides ago from the estimated model with the headline inflation Taylor rule. And let's maybe talk first about the most noticeable result, which is the optimal policy. Because here from these results, it um, seems very clear that the planner favors output stabilization over like immediate inflation stabilization in this framework. So we see that although the shock is inflationary, we see as the optimal response an initial cut in interest rates, which is also pretty significant. And we see that this response then clearly mitigates the kind of contraction and real activity a lot. So here you see the response of um, consumption of savers and the consumption of hand-to-mouth agents. And you see that both of these in the optimal response contract much less. And this also, of course, then holds for real GDP while the inflation response, so the planner kind of mitigates this loss in output while accepting this at a cost of accepting higher inflation temporarily. And this holds for headline inflation, so in the sense that the planner looks through these increases in energy prices for a while, but it also holds for temporarily um, higher core inflation. So you see here that in the Taylor rule responses, core inflation uh, increases less than in the optimal response. But of course, these effects are temporary, so around quarter four, so after a year, we see that core inflation goes back to steady state pretty quickly. But again, the planner seems to be okay with temporarily higher inflation at the um, for the benefit of mitigating the output fall. And what we see here in the core inflation simulation, so if we just swap out headline with core inflation in the Taylor rule, that although this is still fairly far away from the optimal response, it approximates it a little bit better. So of course, since the central bank now doesn't react to this surge in energy prices, we have a slower like increase and less of an increase in the interest rate. And so this response also mitigates the fall in real activity, so in consumption and GDP pretty noticeably, but of course, also at the cost of temporarily higher headline inflation. But as you can see here, this effect is not very big. So it's really at the beginning of the response is temporarily higher. But then, um, yeah, since core inflation is then stabilized more effectively, this effect is really transitory and small. Okay, so let me conclude here. What we have seen from the empirical analysis is that an increase in the carbon price or carbon price shock leads to inflationary pressures, a drop in economic activity, which is pretty significant, and a gradual reduction in greenhouse gas emissions. And we have seen that the estimated model is able to capture this with these um, certain features that we talked about. And as for monetary policy, the optimal monetary policy response seems to favor the mitigation of output losses at the cost of temporarily higher inflation. Thank you very much.
Thank you, Sophia. So, Ben and Larry. And Very interesting. Um, so you had this interesting result on the on the last slide that uh, the central banks would sort of cut interest rates. Yes. Um, could you unpack that a bit more? I guess it seemed like you have energy showing up sort of both on the demand side and the supply side, yes. right? The, the households you know, consume the energy, but the firms use it in production as well. Um, so I, I, is it because sort of the demand shock component dominates? I, yeah, can you just talk about that a bit more? Yes, so a very like shaping factor in this is that, as I said, energy is very hard to substitute both in production and consumption. And so since this is the case, and also fossil energy is hard to substitute in the energy bundle, then this causes this very significant drop in output that you wouldn't have from, from like a standard markup shock. And this is kind of what shapes this very strong cut in, in interest rates. Another thing is also the very strong fall in hand-to-mouth consumption, since these are like, um, like since their utility is also uh, noticed by the planner. The planner kind of tries to mitigate this extreme fall in the beginning of the hand-to-mouth consumption. And so these are like the two factors that shape this, these responses. So together, be, uh, please, uh, Larry, and then uh, uh, Guido, and then we close it here. Okay, quick, just a quick remark here, and I, I, I love this presentation, and so I'm not, I'm not suggesting uh, make, making it more complicated or anything, but I, I cannot, um, uh, the, the, in the U.S. in any case, there is a, an obsession. I, I call this a look-through a look policy. Yeah. And uh, in the U.S., everybody's panicked now about look-through because they're afraid that uh, that the higher inflation will become entrenched and then we get de-anchoring, which is not possible. I and mean, you have a rational expectations model with credibility and so on. And I, I just thought, I mean, th th that would move perhaps a little bit a away from your uh, thing. Um, I just I thought that this has to be said in this. Yes. In this <laughs> Thank you. Just a very quick question about the, the, the uh, it's interesting it, it looks almost a little bit like this uh, the central bank and the regulatory policy are going at uh, kind of against each other right because yes. it, like the regulatory policy wants the gdp to go down because that's how you reduce energy yes but i guess in your welfare function there is also the externality the climate externality is is there when you're doing yes. optimal monetary policy yes it is there but the thing with the climate externality i mean it's there's a lot of uncertainty on how to calibrate a climate externality and from like the standard how we do it in macro models the externality is not very big like the externality it takes a long time to materialize the damages from carbon emissions and also the damages are not too damaging then to total factor productivity and this is why this gets a little bit outweighed in the optimal monetary response but is the, is there then the optimal the optimal uh whatever, the, the optimal uh, tax on energy, th th that is not optimal. No, 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 this is not optimal. This is But it would also factor. be optimal to have that more gradual then, if, if what you're saying is probably, right. Probably, probably. So I don't do that. I don't um, uh, compute the optimal. One of the values has to respond because the regulatory policy is too tough at the beginning. And then yes, yes, yes. And then it's like the con contraction that's coming from the regulatory policy is very big, right? And this is clearly non-optimal, yes. Very good. Thank you very much. And let me uh, join, you, join me please again in thanking uh, the presenters of this session.